Our study continues with an examination of redaction criticism. In some ways it can be said that redaction criticism grew out of form criticism. For many uh, redaction critics build upon form criticism in the way that form critics built upon um, source criticism. The redaction critic investigates how the smaller units from the oral tradition or written sources were put together to form larger complexes. But in this slide, it might also be proper to say that redaction criticism was a bit of a rebellion against form criticism. For the redaction critic is interested in viewing each evangelist as an author, not merely a compiler. The final product is the important aspect of this criticism, and redaction criticism seeks to identify the theological motivation of the author, that is, the zitzimleben, the life setting of the evangelist. This is accomplished by examining the way in which the author used the materials available to him, which tells us much about his situation. Now we'll begin our study of redaction criticism by looking at, briefly at a scholar who anticipates redaction criticism. When uh, Wilhelm Vreda wrote his book, The Messianic Secret, in Mark. Most scholars looked at Mark as sort of the plain historical gospel, the history of Jesus. But Vreda didn't believe this. In fact, he thought Mark was motivated by a specific theological um, belief. According to Vreda, after Jesus died, when the uh, church began to proclaim that he was the Messiah, Freda says there was a problem because everyone knew Jesus never claimed to be the Messiah. So in order to, to cover this gap, uh, he argues that Mark writes a gospel in which he reads back into Jesus' life this secrecy motif. So he keeps the demon, he silences the demons. He silences those who want to go out and preach so that the early church can now say, you see, Jesus did, uh, he was the Messiah, and it was secrecy all along that kept people from knowing that he was the Messiah. Now, there are a lot of problems with Vreda's view, but what we want to do is to pay attention to the fact that he's beginning to read Mark theologically. Now, we wouldn't agree with his historical analysis at all, but there is a messianic secret in Mark, and by looking at the gospel itself, one can determine or can see that it has a theological orientation. Now, in, in what follows, we're going to look at the work of three scholars, uh, each of who do a bit of work with one of the particular gospels. We'll begin by a scholar, with a scholar by the name of uh, Gunther Bornkamm. Bornkamm was a student of Rudolf Bultmann, and he wrote a little uh, piece that you may have already read called The Stilling of the Storm in Matthew. This is the little text in Matthew 8, 23 through 27. Now what Bornkamm wants to, to do is to look at this and see look at this text and see if we can tell the ways in which Matthew has modified this text and to find out what that tells us about Matthew's theology. He comes up with two or three things. First of all, he notices that the text appears in a different location in Matthew than it does in Mark. In Matthew, instead of being in just a geographical location, it is part of a long series of miracle stories. Borncom notes that in Matthew 5-7, through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, we get the words of the Messiah. And in chapters 8 and 9, we get the deeds of the Messiah. One miracle piled on top of another miracle story. The other thing that Borncom notes is that the, the things the disciples say in calling upon Jesus reveal something of Matthew's theology. For in Mark, the disciples cry, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? In Matthew, the disciples cry, Lord, save us. So for Borncom, what has happened is that Matthew views the disciples as the little ship of the church, and that their cry for being saved from this adversity in Mark has been changed into a cry for salvation itself. 
So Borncom is showing that there are modifications in the gospel traditions that reflect theological orientation. The second example we will consider is a scholar by the name of Hans Konzelmann, also a student of Bultmann's. Konzelmann wrote a very influential book called The Theology of St. Luke. And in some ways, it may be the most important contribution from the redaction critical perspective. For Konzelmann, Luke is not the, theolo the historian, but rather a self-conscious theologian. Konzelmann says he is motivated in no way by a desire for historical accuracy, but entirely by his theological conception of the role of Jerusalem in salvation history. Now, according to Konzelmann, Luke sees history in terms of three epochs. There is first the epoch of Israel, uh, from where the prologue ends through about chapter 4, verse 12. Now, he notes that contrary to Matthew and Mark, Luke does not see the ministry of John the Baptist as part of Jesus' ministry any more than Isaiah is part of Jesus' ministry. John is part of what you might call the Old Testament prophetic tradition. He does not, Konzelman points out, preach the kingdom in Luke as he does in Matthew and Mark. His message is the same message as the prophets. The second epoch is, is what he calls the epoch of Jesus which goes from Luke 4.13 through the Ascension. Now this is a part of time clearly distinguished from that which precedes it and that which follows it. In fact, this begins with the uh, temptation account where Satan leaves Jesus and um, Consulman believes or argues that what Luke is saying is he leaves Jesus until about chapter 22. And so that Jesus is able to work unimpeded. During this period, the Spirit is for Jesus alone. Uh, Jesus' entire ministry is a prophecy of the kingdom of God and a guarantee that the kingdom of God will indeed come. The third epoch, according to Konzelman, is the epoch of the church and the Spirit. This epoch goes from Pentecost to the Perusia. And in, is, in this period, the Spirit is uh, Jesus' substitute for the disciples and allows them to enter into the kingdom of God. Now, one of the reasons that uh, Konzelman's work is so important is because um, a number of scholars, including in particular James Dunn, who have studied Pentecostalism and, and Pentecostal spirit baptism, as a critic, have taken Konzelman's view and built upon it as if these epics are hermetically sealed off from one another. Pentecostal scholar Roger Stronstad, who wrote a powerful little book called The Charismatic Theology of St. Luke, challenges this whole paradigm, pointing out that the spirit is operative and at work in each of these epics, people being filled with the spirit throughout. So redaction criticism uh, becomes important. Now again, with, with Han Kons, Hans Konzelman's view, the, the point is not so much to pick apart what he said or to be you know need to feel like we have to prove that he's right or wrong, as much as it is for our vantage point to see that he is interpreting uh, the Gospels theologically and picking up on certain things that are in the Gospels themselves. The third, go the third uh, example comes from uh, a scholar who works on Mark's gospel, Billy Markson. Markson wrote a book called Mark the Evangelist. And Markson is the person who appears to have coined the term uh, Redaktion Geschichte, the German term which means uh, the history of redaction or the history of editing. Now, Mark, uh, Markson suggests that the only way to understand the gospel is to understand it as preaching, not as history. He makes use of those three Zitzimlebens that we talked about earlier, 
This is some laymen of Jesus, the early church, and of the evangelist, in his analysis of Mark. And what he proposes is that Mark was written very close in time to the destruction of Jerusalem and was written with the purpose of getting people to leave Jerusalem. In fact, it is constructed, Markson suggests, around Galilee. Now for Markson, Galilee is not of what we might say historical geographical significance. For Markson, it is what he would call of eschatological geographical significance. In other words, Jesus doesn't go to Galilee where Jesus is, so says Markson, is Galilee. In other words, Galilee takes on um, a theological significance. And, and if Jesus has gone on to Galilee, the disciples need to, to leave Jerusalem and go be with Jesus himself. Thus, Markson shows how that, uh, Markson's work, we're able to see how, um, how that the theological motivation he uh, proposes there um, comes into play in the analysis of the gospel. Now, the thing about redaction criticism is, is that one does not necessarily have to be a historical skeptic to make use of redaction criticism. To identify the theological motivation of the author doesn't necessarily uh, tell us anything about historicity. In other words, to identify the theological motivation uh, does not necessarily mean what the writer is describing did not occur. There are scholars who are more conservative who have put their hand to redaction criticism, and we're going to look at a couple of them for a moment. The first one we'll consider is a guy named Ned Stonehouse. Ned Stonehouse was a scholar who uh, was one of the founding fathers of the Evangelical Theological Society, a society which has a very, very conservative view of Scripture and high view of Scripture. Stonehouse wrote the book, The Origins of the Synoptic Gospels, and there he speaks to he seeks to speak to the issues raised by redaction critics. In one short essay, he looks at the story of the rich young ruler as a test case. And he one of the, his observations is that none of the gospels call him the rich young ruler. One of them says he's rich, one of them says he's young, one of them says he's a ruler. Well, um, Stonehouse in his analysis uh, points out that certain tendencies that one might expect are not found. For example, uh, in Mark's Gospel, uh, Jesus says to the, to the young man, um, Why do you call me good? There is only one good, and that is God. Now we might expect that to be changed as Matthew changes it. Matthew says, uh, quotes it as, uh, Jesus saying, why do you speak to me about the good? But Luke sees no reason to make that change. And so, one of the points Stonehouse makes is, you don't always have a refining or softening that one might expect. But he finds other things uh, that are very interesting. Uh, there are differences in the narratives. Mark and Luke have on Jesus' lips one thing you lack, while Matthew has the, the young man initiating, what do I still lack? Mark 10, 29 quotes Jesus as saying, for my sake and the gospel's sake, Matthew tells it this way, for my name's sake, Luke tells it this way, for the sake of the kingdom of God. Now I suppose that one could say what Jesus really said was, for my sake, the gospel's sake, my name's sake, and the sake of the kingdom of God, but in that case, nobody gets it right. All of them get a piece of it, if that's the case. But, but, but for Stonehouse, his conclusion is that, that the writers of the Gospels are not always concerned with giving us what our scholars call the ipsissima verba of Jesus, the exact words of Jesus. Rather, they have some flexibility in, 
in the way that they convey the gospel message. But they always convey it in an authentic and trustworthy fashion. The defenders of infallibility have consistently made the point that one is, does not properly understand infallibility if the implication is that the words of Jesus are reported uh, in the Gospels as uh, ipsissima verba. What is involved, rather, is that the Holy Spirit guided the human authors in such a way to ensure that the records are, uh, are accurate, an accurate and trust, trustworthy impression of the Lord's teaching. By this, word, by this word impression, he does not mean a feeling, but impression in terms of what a signet ring leaves uh, in a soft substance. So you can see, you can actually see uh, its presence. The other person that we're going to talk about just briefly is a scholar by the name of Grant Osborne. Now, Grant Osborne has written considerably on um, the Gospels and redaction criticism in particular. And when he looks at the Gospels, he finds that there are certain differences that are uh, difficult to explain. For example, he compares Mark 15, 34, his cry, uh, Jesus' cry on the cross. Mark tells us was Eloi, Eloi, which is in Aramaic, while in Matthew 27, 47, Matthew conveys that as Eli, Eli, which is a Hebrew version. Uh, different uh in, in different parables, uh, one writer will say that a question comes from Jesus. Another writer will say that the question comes from his dialogue partners. Uh, he looks at the institution, the words of institution uh, of the Last Supper amongst the synoptics where there's variation, as well as the uh, uh, resurrection accounts. Now, according to Osborne, who, who also is a member of ETS and has a very high view of Scripture, he says the solution is to recognize interpretation on the part of the evangelist who sought to bring out the true meaning of an event or saying for his readers. Now in adapting the tradition this way, they never, he says, alter the saying or event out of keeping with its original occurrence. Rather, they use paraphrase or what he calls the principle of omission and expansion. Uh, one example of such might be uh, the fact that in Mark 10 and Math in Mark 10, Jesus, when speaking about divorce, says no divorce. Period. The parallel account in Matthew 19 has no divorce except for pornea. Well, apparently, if you took this view. What happened in, in the Mark 10 event is Jesus says no divorce, period. But Matthew knows from the Sermon on the Mount that what Jesus intends is no divorce except for. And consequently, we find it in um, chapter 19. Osborne says that the, the, the point is not so much the ipsissima verba, the exact words, but rather the ipsissima vox, that is, the exact voice of Jesus. Now, Osborne gives us some suggestions on how to make use of redaction criticism so that we can find the uh, theological orientation of the writer, and we'll uh, list those here. He says, first of all, study the, the seams that introduce material and provide transition to other material. He says, note the summary statements and fit them into the broader development of the narrative. Trace the editorial asides and the explanatory notes. Note the alterations, that is, the omissions or expansions between the Gospels. Number five, he says that the arrangement of the material by the evangelist is probably the most important single clue to his theological core. Six, one must differentiate between the themes and emphases that are carried throughout the, to the end of a gospel and those that dominate only one section. Now, now the point of all of this is that, that writers can be conservative or liberal in their use of redaction criticism. 
But methodologically, what we want to pay attention to is that there is a shift from seeing uh, the gospel traditions as being like a, a string of pearls, that it doesn't matter how you arrange those pearls, as some form critics had said at one time, to viewing the uh, documents from the perspective of the author. Now the next uh, method that we're going to look at very briefly are narrative approaches to the Gospels. Narrative criticism in some ways builds on redaction criticism, but for narrative critics, the author, the place of composition, none of those issues are important. What's important is the text itself, the way the text tells the story. Uh, one doesn't bring anything to the text and try to hypothetically reconstruct the author or his audience, but rather pays attention to the text itself. Let me give you a couple of examples. In John's Gospel, John the Baptist comes preaching and comes baptizing. But the way John defines his baptism in John's Gospel is he comes baptizing in water in order that the Messiah might be revealed to Israel. Now pay attention to that word, Israel. If you uh, know the synoptics, you know that John's baptism is a conversion baptism for the forgiveness of sin. But in John's Gospel, that is not how the baptism is described. It is described to reveal the Messiah to Israel. Now, two of John's disciples encounter Jesus. And they say to Jesus, where do you stay? Where do you abide? Where do you dwell? The Greek verb there can be translated in all those ways. And Jesus responds to them with these enigmatic words. He says, come and see. Well, we know the story very well, how that uh, Andrew finds his brother Simon. We then find that Philip finds a figure named Nathaniel. And Nathaniel says to Philip, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip says what Jesus has earlier said, come and see. Now when Jesus encounters Nathaniel, what does he say about Nathaniel? He says, behold a true Israelite in whom there is no deceit. Now John comes baptizing to reveal the Messiah to Israel and now we encounter a true Israelite. Now Nathaniel will go on to say of Jesus that we know you are the Son of God. We know that you are the King of Israel. Now this theme we could continue in various ways. When we get to uh, the story of Nicodemus, we find that Jesus says, you are the teacher of Israel, and you don't understand these things. And later we get to the Samaritan woman who has this incredibly salvific e event with Jesus, this encounter with Jesus. And when she goes to tell the people in the town about him, she says, come see a man who told me everything I ever knew. The story itself unfolds. The story itself defines its parameters. So narrative critics pay very little attention to authorship and date and place of composition and those sorts of things, but focus much more on the story. I'll give you one other example. There is in Mark's Gospel two accounts of the healing of blinded eyes. There is in chapter 8 this man that encounters Jesus that Jesus has to lay hands on twice for him to receive his sight. The other blind man that we encounter occurs at the end of chapter 10. The very familiar story of blind Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus will not be refused his healing. You think about that section as the opening of blinded eyes, and what you find is that those two blind men receive their sight, 
And the material that stands between those two blind man, men talk about the struggles of the disciples' understanding. Because on three occasions between those two blind men receiving their sight, Jesus will predict his death and resurrection. And on each occasion, the disciples utter something incredibly stupid. I say that with a great deal of uh, love for the disciples. I myself have said stupid things. Jesus says he must suffer and die. Peter says he rebukes him. He says, no, Lord, you're wrong about this. You'll never suffer and die in this way. On the second occasion, he predicts his death and resurrection, and a fight breaks out amongst the disciples about who's the greatest. The third time, he predicts his death and resurrection and Peter and John, uh, John uh, and James come with requests to sit at his right and left hand. The story gets told in an incredible way, and we are participating in that narrative. The final thing I want to mention very briefly is a category I would uh, entitle reader-oriented approaches. One of the things that we've discovered over the years of reading texts is that people read texts differently and people see different things in the text. So that, for example, when women were not well represented in theological training, women were often ignored in, in the Bible. But since women have begun to read Scripture, we found an enormous amount about women in the Bible. There are people who read Scripture from contexts of oppression, who see things differently than those who read from contexts of wealth. As Pentecostals, we see certain things in the texts that other people don't see. Now, it is possible to read things into the text, but it's also possible for our eyes to let us see things that are there that other writers or readers are missing. And so it's kind of a check and balance. People can go overboard. People can read texts, and if they don't agree with them, sit in authority over them and dismiss those texts as not having any relevance for them. But at the same time, for Pentecostal readers, kind of a theological reading, one might say, of Scripture, we are very interested in the text. And if there's something in the text that we don't like, we tend to sit with it longer and longer so that we can understand it better and better. Reader-oriented approaches can be sometimes a bit bizarre, but often reading text through other people's eyes allow us to see things that we've not seen before. And in the final analysis, if we're not looking to be interpreted by the text, if we're not looking to be changed by the text, there's really not much uh, reason to read the text. So in this, these two uh, lectures today, we've looked at the developing trends in New Testament studies over the last century. Next week, we will begin to look at a distinctive Pentecostal paradigm to the study of Scripture.